Yeah, I didn't want to do anything big and like big and flashy. Hello, attendees. As everybody's streaming in, welcome to APA's webinar with the Lightroom guys. Um, I hope everybody's doing well and uh, ready to pick up some cool tips. Uh, I know I am. And um, you know what? I'm not going to say much more than welcome. And uh, DA and Dave, why don't I hand it over to you? Thanks for joining us today. Uh, what do you got for us? Thank you, Travis. Uh, my name is David Mark Erickson, and this is my business partner, DA Wagner. And together, we're the Lightroom guy. Mm, how does that work? Plural, singular? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, what we do is we provide expert level support for digital photography. So if you kind of think of the intersection of digital photography, um, computer hardware and software and sort of where those all over inter overlap or intersect, that's where we uh, provide a lot of specialized technical information. So we help teach people Lightroom, we advise them uh, what new camera equipment they wanna buy, we teach them how to use that, we make books for people, we teach them how to make books. So anything that sort of intersects between those areas is really where our, our specialty is. Um, and you should be able to find us, I think in the participants thing, there's a, a link to our blog, but we're at lightroomguy.com. So you can find us there. I'm sure we'll put up some links in the, the chat here. Yeah, for Just sure. Just to let you know right off the bat, um, uh, for people that have questions, we're monitoring the Q&A panel. So um, uh, we're gonna kind of pull questions, but if you have something right there, we have a Q&A panel uh, that's there and that, uh, that is where you'll direct all your questions and not each other's chat channel. So Q&A it, feel free. That's what we're here for. So today's uh, webinar, we're gonna plan for just about an hour. And the focus is, is that we want you to be able to walk away from this webinar with a couple of practical tools that you can take and apply to your everyday workflow. Um, Lightroom is big, it's complex, it can be messy. There's three or four different ways oftentimes to get to the same result. And we figured, well, let's try and work on these webinars so that we get really specific and really tight on just a couple of skills that you can just pick up and start using without, you know, altering or changing your whole workflow. So, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the first half of the demo uh, and I'm gonna talk about the compare tool and the before and after features that are in the develop module. And then while I'm doing that, DA is gonna be monitoring the questions and answers. So feel free to ask questions. And then when I'm done with mine, I'll have a few minutes to maybe take a couple of live questions um, and then we'll flip it. DA is going to talk about doing dodging and burning using some of the local adjustment tools in Lightroom in the develop module. And then I'll, I'll be monitoring the Q&A and then he'll take a couple of questions at the end of that. Um, I just wanted to add, yeah. there's a, a link for downloads of two files. Oh, I'm going to get to that. Great. Yeah. Um, so something important to know is that th this is a demonstration, it's a presentation. If you want to follow along with Lightroom, you're welcome to do so on your own computer. But you, these have also been designed that you can just sit back and watch and just sort of take it all in as we go. And we are using Lightroom Classic. We're not using the other cloud version of Lightroom. Um, and you'll see the, the difference. I mean, hopefully you know the difference. And if not, then please do ask and we can explain how uh, that goes. Um, in Lightroom CC or the cloud version, the newer version of Lightroom, the compare tool and the before and after tools, which I'm going to be demoing, are not the same. Uh, there's no compare tool and the before and after is very rudimentary, it's very simple. So if, you, if you're work, working in the other version of Lightroom, you won't be able to follow along with what I'm doing. However, with the local adjustment tools that DA is gonna show, those tools are in Lightroom cloud but they're just accessed differently. But the same functionality and features are in the newer version of Lightroom. And as D DA just uh, so adroitly or um, uh, timely mentioned, there are demo files. There are two files that DA is going to use. And if you want to use those to follow along or practice afterwards, then you're welcome to download. We put up a blog post. There's a link for that. It should be in the chat. I hope uh, the chat folks put that there. And I think that's it. DA, anything else? Did I miss anything? I think that's it. Uh, I think we're all set to start working. Okay, great. So Travis, I'm gonna enlist you. I wanna use your help. Awesome. Um, talking to an amorphous mass of humanity behind a screen is a little abstract for face. me. I'm the face of all the attendees. 
<laughs> exactly. Thank you. And so I'll kind of uh, talk to you and you can kind of interact with me as I go through uh, the stuff that I'm going to show. And that'll just help me like, you know, keep track of what it is that I'm doing. So let me get my notes open here for the compare outline. And let me share my screen. Where is my screen? Where is my Lightroom? My Lightroom is not there. Stand by. The first thing we're going to teach is how to share a screen. <laughs> <laughs> My Lightroom is running, but Zoom didn't want to see that it was a valid. Oops. Whoa. Yes, up. Are you seeing my Lightroom? We sure are. Yep. We are. OK, good. Whew. <laughs> First technological hurdle passed. You know, if okay. you didn't so it, I'm going to hide known. the. No, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Only you knew. OK. So the compare tool is a tool that's available in the library module. And I'm gonna start from the grid view of the library module here. And I know I'm in the library module because I got library lit up here at the top. I'm gonna start at the grid. And, and if I'm looking at some photos or if I'm working somewhere, I might be in a loop view, just looking at a single photo. I like to use grid view as my home screen. This is like how I, if I'm in the middle of something and I wanna get back and start another process, grid view is sort of my home base. And um, the way I get to that is hitting the G key. G is in George, and I just or G is in Grid. So we're going to start there. And the next thing we got to look at is down here at the toolbar. And if you don't see this toolbar down here, sometimes it disappears. That's because it can be hidden. And if you want to bring it back because you can't see it. You can go to the view pull down menu and you can choose right here hide toolbar hide toolbar or show toolbar and it has a shortcut key as well which is t so we want to be able to see the toolbar down here and the next thing we need to see is the view modes and you can see down over here in this corner there are five icons down here there's a grid view a loop view this is the compare view, survey, and faces. Uh, and we're going to be working in this compare view in a second. But if you don't see this either for some reason, there's a little disclosure triangle over here on the right side of the toolbar. And you can see that I can turn on and off a number of different features here. And if you don't see view mode, make sure you turn on view modes, that first checkbox there. And you so is there a way, like say I've messed up a lot of these things, can you just restore like in Photoshop to a, a base setting quickly? That's a good question. I don't know about the toolbars. There are some ways you can reset the dialogues, but mm -hmm. I DA'd you. There's no way to reset the views, I don't think. Because like in Photoshop, uh, you can just hit re reset to photo, to photo workspace. So it brings everything back mm -hmm. like windows and all that kind of stuff and brings it back. I'm, to not, a, a, I'm not aware of a feature like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, I don't think there is one. Um, that's yeah. a, a really good question. I will have to bring that up with Adobe. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Do you guys see my video panel or is that hidden? Uh, in terms of you? Yeah, am I, I sharing my video? Top, panel? Uh, depending on uh, what your uh, panel people. I just have. want to be able to see you, uh, um, so I'm uh, I can see it. Okay, good. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into the compare mode, mm -hmm. and I can do that either by clicking on the little icon that's right here, or I can tap the C key, C for compare. And what compare is used for is to be able to hold one photo in our view while we look at other photos so that we can compare one to another. Um, and we can see here that the first thing that we see we're in compare mode is we've got a left right split screen here. If you look up at the top, you see select and candidate. So the photo on the left is going to be the photo that we have chosen to hold on to. And the photo on the right is going to be the photo that we're going to move through. Now, what is this tool used for? Primarily, it was designed so that if you've got a burst or a sequence of photos, you can compare which one in the sequence you would like to use. So as we'll see in these, I, I took a whole bunch of this woman um, cooking rice, and it's like, OK, which one is the one that I want to use? Which one shows the best? And oftentimes, the best way to look at that is to, even if it's not the strongest image, just have one image in mind. And then as you're looking at new photos, 
you know, your brain, you're going to start to think about what is it that I'm looking for in this photo, which one shows or tells my story the best. So that's the intended purpose of it. Um, I'm sure people have other various ways that they can use it, but that, that's the primary thing and that's what we're going to focus on today. So as I said, we've got the split screen, we've got the select and the candidate. And something that's a little bit tricky and a little bit important to pay attention to is this, there's a very thin white box around my select right now. And if I click over to candidate, that white box changes. And that's our most selected. So if you see down in the film strip, the number two photo will get a little bit brighter, whiter. That means it's the most selected photo. And that means is if I want to tag this photo or flag it or star it, I can do so. And I'm not going to tag or flag the other one. Um, and so that allows me to, to manipulate some metadata. So as I'm moving through, as I'm walking through my film strip and looking at number of photos, I could use, say, a star rating if, I, if that's something that you have for your workflow. Is it's a one star, two star on up, you know, to, to indicate the strength of the photo that you might want to use. Or if you want to flag it uh, as a pick or uh, a reject or uh, use a color label. Um, and so you got to make sure when you're doing that, that whatever your most selected photo is, it has that little white, very ephemeral box around it. The next thing I want to focus you in on is this little toolbar. Do you see this little toolbar down here between the, the main toolbar and the image? Oh, yeah. So while I'm working, and no matter which photo I have selected as my, my most selected, I can flag any photo or reject any photo by just clicking on those buttons. You give it a star rating, give it a color label. So I can do the same metadata work either through my keyboard shortcuts or by using those little metadata uh, tag or uh, um, tools so down there. You, if you use pick right now, it would light up as a shortcut. If you use the shortcut, it would light up as well. So you can do it from two places. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, let me double check what you're saying. So this is where it's a little tricky. If I use the toolbar down here, I don't have to be selected on that photo. But if I hit the P key right now to flag it as a pick, it's going to go over to the one that's on the left because that's the one that's selected. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So I'm going to use the U key to remove that flag and the U key to remove that flag because I selected, notice I select, I changed the selection. And I'm still highlighted on this one on to the, to the uh, right. And I'm going to hit the zero key to zero out those stars. Now, let me check my notes here. Mini toolbar. OK. Now, that, we're going to get back to this X key in a minute because it does something a little bit funky. But we'll, we'll get to that when we get into the operations. The next thing I want to draw your attention to is the film strip down here at the bottom. And we're going to use the film strip to walk through our images to compare to our select. Now, if you don't see your film strip, again, like many things in Lightroom, it can be hidden. And if you want to find it again, if you go to the Windows pull-down menu and you go to Panels, you have a option here, Show Film Strip. Now, <clears throat> for some people, F6, that's the keyboard shortcut for it, will work. Some Macs aren't defaulted for function keys. Some are Windows, more likely. But just know that you know that's the, the keyboard shortcut, and you can always find it in the window. But more easily is that there's a little disclosure triangle down here at the bottom. So if you don't feel it, see your film strip, just come down here to the bottom and click, and then your film strip will appear. So in the film strip, if we look at our two photos down here that are kind of highlighted, you'll notice this white little diamond in the upper right-hand corner. And you'll notice a black little diamond in the upper corner of this one. The white diamond is corresponds to my select photo. And the black, wait, what did, I, did I just say that? <laughs> I just confused myself. Um, the white diamond is select. The black diamond is the candidate. And as I walk through, and I'm going to use my keyboard shortcuts, or my, my um, not keyboard shortcuts, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to use my arrow keys here. And I'm going to start walking through the images. So I can see I'm holding the select and I'm comparing it to the candidate. And as I compare, as I move along, that black diamond moves along with me. Okay? So you always know, you can always do a quick check to see which one is which. 
Now, if I come down here and I wanna change which one that is my candidate, I can click on any photo. Oh, no, I can't. I got that backwards. This is, uh, some of these controls are a little funny. Left click, white swap. Yeah, left click, date select. Oh, right, okay, I confused myself. So I can come down here and I can click left click once on any of these photos and it's going to change my select photo. Oh. But if I click on my candidate photo, it's gonna swap the two. Is that? Yep. Okay. So if I'm looking and I go, oh, I don't like any of these, I wanna start over here, boom, I can just start there and that's my select. But if for whatever reason, I like my newer, stronger image that I've got on my candidate, I can just look for the black diamond, tap on it once with the left uh, mouse button, and it's gonna swap positions for me. Okay, and then I can pick up again and move from there. Uh, Make sense? Yep. No, okay. All right, so now I'm gonna come back here and choose this as my select. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, zooming and panning features that we have for um, this. I'm gonna open up the navigator here. And so if I'm looking at this, I'm gonna go, mm, is that rice in focus? Is that a little soft or a little sharp? How's your face? So I can just hover my mouse over there, her face, and it's gonna turn into um, a magnifying glass. It automatically goes one it's, to one, right? What's that? The first click will take it to one to one. Yes, sometimes. Sometimes oh. it might take it to fill. There's a, a weird, it's a weird relationship with Navigator, but just know that you can click on it and you can zoom. And then when you get a little hand, you know that you can click and hold and you can pan around on the image. So I can compare, hmm, okay, this is really soft. Uh, her hand here is really soft. You know, I don't really think that that's going to work out either of these photos, but I can click and, and move around. Now, if I want to get closer, I've got two options. I can use the little zoom slider that's right down here and I can walk through all my zoom steps and get in really close. And again, I've got a locked uh, image between the two, right? They're sort of in sync. Now, if I wanna zoom out, I can walk back up the zoom slider or I can jump up to the navigator and I can click fit, fill, one to one or choose a different ratio if that's what's going to work for me. Would a uh, control plus or minus work here as well? It certainly would. Ah, okay. Z works as well and spacebar works as well. Ah, okay. Those are all zoomy uh, keyboard shortcuts. Now, if I want to look at her without locking, without moving with the same image, if I unclick this little uh, padlock here, it's gonna free the two images from each other. So now I'm free just to move around with her, oh. zoom in a little bit and get in close. Uh, Eleven to one's a little bit much. <laughs> Let me come back out to, to two to one. I think that'll be a better, uh, more instructive. Um, so I've got two to one there and I can just move around. Now, if I wanna sync those two views up, I've got this little button here called sync. Oh. And it'll place the second image into the same position as the first image. So I'm looking at the same area of the screen. And if I wanna relock those together, I can close that padlock and now I'm in sync. Cool? Yeah. Right. Now, as I'm traversing these images here, if I find an image that I like, and I wanna now make it my select, I can do a couple of things. One, I can, I can click on it, as I showed you before, I could click on this one right now and it would change. Or I've got a couple of little shortcut buttons here. I've got this Y to X button, and I got this X, Y swap button. So if I click this make select, it's gonna take my current candidate image and now make it my select image. And if I want to swap the positions of those two, I've got those two, that button there to reverse the whatever it is. Good. And then I've got these little arrow buttons here, which is the same as my keyboard uh, arrows, and I can walk back and forth. 
Now, if I'm scrolling along, it doesn't, one thing I don't like about this is that it doesn't move the film strip for me, but that might also be annoying because I want to keep my select in view of my film strip. So if I want to catch up to myself in the film strip, I've got to manually move myself. Right. Now in the candidate, if I hit the, we're going to go back to this little X button. If I click that X, it's going to close out that image. It's going to kind of reset the view and it's going to take my candidate and it's going to put it to the one that's immediately to the right of my select. And if I click the X of my candidate, it kind of does a swap thing as well. It's a, it's a little weird, funky behavior, yeah. but yeah. But so it's pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. right? Any questions on that? No, it looks pretty straightforward right there. Yeah. So I'm going to demo this really quick with uh, some photos that I took. I've gonna, got my other collection here. I made a couple of specialty collections for this out of my nice. main catalog. And I'm going to start looking. I've got this picture. I was on safari last summer guiding a photo safari. And uh, we came upon this leopard late in the day and just beautiful, magnificent animal sitting up on this termite mound. And I took a lot of photos. <laughs> <laughs> we were there for about 45 minutes and we were just, you know, banging away, having a good old time. And it's like, oh my gosh, like, how am I going to pick the one that I want? <laughs> so this is a perfect application for the tool. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose, I've got my select and I'm going to just start walking through and seeing if there's one that I like. And here I could go, Ooh, that's a nice one. I'll give it a one star. Oh, I was on the wrong. Uh, I've got to make my thing over there. One star, right? This is one I've already developed. That was sort of in the, in the collection. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's clearly a good one. Um, so I can just walk through and now if I wanted to, you know, give something a two star or a one star or flag it, I could do that. I'm going to bypass that because we've got to, got to be mindful of our time here. Um, and I actually chose this one earlier when I was doing all this practice stuff for it. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with this one because I kind of know it. But say this is the one that I want to choose, you know, and I could, oh, I'm going to give it a red or, you know, it's going to be a, a four star or a five star, whatever my, whatever my rating system is. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to come out of the um, compare mode. I'm just going to go to the grid because that's just the way I roll. Um, and my photo is down here. There it is. And I'm going to take it over to the develop mode. And now we're going to start getting into the before and after uh, features of Lightroom. I'm going to reset this image so that we can start fresh. Uh, two star. I don't like red. It's too, too angry for me. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through a very truncated developing process, but that is to show you how the before and after tool works in the development process. Right. And DA is going to pick up some of these tools when he does his thing. So this is going to sort of flow from one thing to the other. So personally, me, I like to crop at the beginning. Some people don't, doesn't matter either way. Everybody's got their, their thing. So I'm going to bring uh, this down. Hey, you know what? I think I'm going to use this for Instagram. So I'm going to go to a one-to-one -one crop ratio. Um, let's tighten it up. Let's leave some uh, space to the side there. All right, maybe tighten it up a slight bit more. Great. Okay. Happy enough for the, with this crop for, um, for our purposes. Now I'm going to use the auto button. And DA is going to talk a little bit more about this as well. But the auto button in the latest versions of Lightroom is greatly improved. And for me, it works, uh, I get there about 70% of the time, I get a really good result from it. And then I can always tweak uh, going from there. And I'm gonna show you that just now. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the auto button. So pretty good job. Now, before I take the next step, I, I do, I wanna check like, where did I come from and where did I go to? So I'm gonna use the backslash key. And if you look on your keyboard, you see your return key over on the right hand side, just above that typically there's backslash key, which sort of goes from a high left to a low right. And if I tap that, Lightroom is now going to show me my image from before I started doing developing. Right. And you can tell that you're in the before and after mode, number one, because up here in the corner, it says before, and then down here in the toolbar, it says before. And when you're in a normal view, you don't have any of that. You're just in your normal view. So you know when you're in the in a before view. 
Now it's really important to, to make a note about what the before is showing you because it's not before what, right? It's, it's a time thing. If you, when you import a photo into Lightroom, that initial import is the baseline for that image as far as Lightroom is concerned. So if you apply a developing preset to um, a photo as it's coming in, that's the baseline. Lightroom doesn't know anything before that. It's only there. So the before view, the simplest, the, this most simple view of the before view, I'm gonna move my camera here a little bit, is just that backslash key. Now, there's one other place where um, this could be a little different, which is if you created a virtual copy. Right. When you create a virtual copy, it sort of starts from, that's the baseline. Whatever develop settings have been taken to that level of, the, of that photo, when you create a virtual copy, it jumps over and that's the baseline for the image. So you're never going to get beyond that on a virtual copy from, from where you are at that starting point. But if you hit reset on a virtual, then it goes back to the other baseline. No, to that baseline that you created it at. No, you can, I'm pretty sure. You, Does it? I, yeah, it'll reset it to the other one. Okay, well, anyway, we'll... Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, argument for the sages. <laughs> <laughs> so from here, now I'm going to go back and forth with, my before and after and you know it's done an okay job it's pumped up some of the colors it's balanced out some of the the highlights and the shadows now i want to do some more tweaking to this um that um to try to get some more out of it so i'm going to take my dehaze i'm going to swing out pretty wide and then bring it back down and find a comfortable place for it okay that's good right there i'm going to tap my before and after key again to see. This is kind of like, Travis, do you cook? Yeah, absolutely. Love to. Everybody cooks nowadays, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> you have to, <laughs> if you want to eat. <laughs> That's right. So it's like when you're cooking, you always want to be tasting your food. Yeah. How's it going? A little more salt, a little more pepper, a little more herbs, whatever, right? So before and after is really that, that you know, tasting. How am I doing? How am I going along here? Um, and I see that I'm running short on time. I don't want to eat too much into DA's time. So I'm going to speed this up real quick. So I'm gonna do before and after. So I like where I'm at with the dehaze there now. So now I wanna punch up the colors a little bit and I'm gonna kick in some saturation. And I go, oh, that's way too saturated. That's, that's too much for me. And I go, yeah, no, like not good, right? Too, um, too candy, sticky candy. So I'm gonna dial it back before and after. All right, looking good. Like I'm, I'm somewhere here. I'm gonna bring it down a little bit more before and after. Okay, good. So for our purposes, I'm going to hold off, hold it right there and, and call that decent. Right. Now, this is where before and after is going to get a little bit fun because it's more than just the backslash key. If you look down in your toolbar again, you've got this little double YY button. And it actually, that's a little visual clue. Your before and after is toggled by the Y key for your keyboard shortcut. Okay. If I tap Y, well, let me mention too before, the next thing I'm going to do, I want to clean this image up a little bit. I want to add some texture to really sharpen those details. And I'm going to add some sharpening and then kick in with a little noise reduction because this photo was at 2800 at the ISO. So it's, it's got a little, little noise in there. So I want to clean that up. But to do that, I really want to be in close with my image, right? So any kind of thing that has to do with sharpening and noise, you should be really up close with your image so that you can see the, de the level of detail that you're impacting. But I want to do that using the before and after tool so I can see where I really am. Mm -hmm. So back to this little button, I'm going to tap the Y key, or I could just click that button. And now, oops, we're going to get to, hold on, I was, I was at an old setting. There we go. There's a left right split. So on the left, I have my before image and on my right, I have my after image. And uh -huh. as I, I can again, zoom in and I can use the navigator to move around with that and I can change my zoom level. So here, now this is really going to give me a clear um, reference point as I'm adding texture. Have I added too much because I can compare to my old mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. in immediately, not waiting to go to the back and forth, but in real time as I go. So good. Now I'm going to, I've got a little texture there. Good. 
Now I want to get into some sharpening and some noise reduction. I've got more options though with my before and after. And if you notice in that little button down there, if I pop open that disclosure triangle, I've got a left right split. Oh yeah. I've got a top bottom. I'll just show you the top bottom, right? It's just two images one of the other. But the split is what's really cool. There's the image cut in half. And I can really get in close there and see the level of detail that I'm working on in real time. So I know that if I'm, yeah. if I'm um, uh, messing too much with this image or not. So I'm going to go into my detail here. Uh, I've already got sharpening set on this, uh, a little bit of sharpening on this photo. I'm going to bring up the mask to about 80. If a uh, quick uh, pro tip there, if you hold the option key, holding the option key and sliding the mask slider, you get to see where the, where the sharpening mask is being applied. Anything in white is um, being sharpened and anything in black is not. So this is a great way to do a quick sharpening of selected areas instead of the whole image at once, right? Right, yeah, well, I'm zoomed in. I'm not, I'm, yeah, exactly, the, for the masking. And now I'm gonna kick in a little noise reduction and we can see as I move the, the split, I can see how much noise reduction I'm adding and whether it's uh, hurting or helping my image. So I'm going back and forth a little bit there. I'm gonna bring it back, not enough. So, you know, maybe right in there, but it really gives me a real time view of what it is that I'm looking at. Right. Um, and that can uh, just really um, um, help my developing process and speed things up. Right. Now, there's a couple more quick advanced level before and after things. There's these buttons down here. Those get really funky because you're swapping settings, but like, and, and, and it can change things. So I, I don't have enough time to go in those to those today because DA has got to take it over here in a second. There's one other cool thing I want to show you is that if I've got a, a big list of uh, developing settings here, mm -hmm. I can grab one of these from the history lesson, from the history lesson, <laughs> from the history <laughs> list and drag it into the before side. I can't drag it to the after side, but I can drag it to the before side and my static view of the image is locked at that point. So if I need to compare what I've done in any part of my history to where I am at now, I can just add that history. I don't want to do the crop um, into the before and I can see where I was and where I've gotten to. Right, right. So now you got to be careful though, because now the, my before is always going to be this. So in this case, I'm going to, uh, reset myself and bring it back to where I had imported the image. So you just can control Z there to reset it or? Uh, you know, it's a good question. I haven't tried control Z. Let me get a, is control Z? Nope. Control D, Z does not do that. Cause you're not actually doing anything. You're just telling the before picture gotcha. to so uh, how do you display reset, how do you reset the point. before picture. You got to go, this is the unfortunate part, is you got to go down to, in your history, mm, that's you, like you got to go down to your import. Very first, okay. Yeah, and drop it in. And then the buttons do some other stuff, these, these swapping buttons, but they get real funky and, and, I, and we don't have enough time to get into the esoteric yep. nature of those. So I'm going to hold any questions that we have until the end because I want to kick it over to DA because he's got some really great stuff about how to do... Um, uh, Something. Um, <laughs> developing. I think he's going to tell us what he's going to tell us. <laughs> yeah, take it away. <laughs> right. So a little less confusing than uh, doing the uh, the editing and the before and after, which actually is a really powerful tool when you use it on a regular basis. Uh, before and after is something that I use really frequently. So um, thanks for doing that. And I had no idea about dragging from the history into the before side. So uh, cool, that's huh? like just super cool. <laughs> Game changer. Well, that's a, and that's what we wanted to do with these. Is these there's these little nuggets that yeah. are just like mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. every yeah. little one helps and changes Absolutely. your workflow. So I'm going to do a couple of exercises here, and I'm going to use what uh, I would have used in in the past as traditional darkroom 
uh, techniques to uh, use uh, local adjustments. And in the past, if anyone's been in the dark room, you know, you put your hands together, you wiggle them around, you tape cardboard to a piece of a hanger and you hold back on the image. And if you've never been in a dark room, you have no reference to that. But these tools are so related to how I used to work in the dark room that I've uh, just adopted those as a, a very important part of my process. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my Lightroom screen. Great. Uh, move that up just a little bit. And I'm just going to uh, start with this image, actually, just to give everybody a quick peek here. Um, and I'll do that and that. So the image on the left, obviously, is my original raw capture. And the image on my right is my finished developed image. And that image was available for download. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to download that if you want to play along. So we're just going to go ahead and work with the before image and move over to the develop module. And like David, I've discovered that the auto button in the develop module is just um, absolutely amazing. Adobe calls it Sensei. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe not quite, <laughs> but I, I would say nine times out of 10. David gets seven times out of 10. I get nine times out of 10. It's a really powerful starting point. And this particular exercise, all I'm going to do is just start with the auto button, single click. I got a little more tone in the background, but you can see this did not really give me uh, good facial details. Here, I might do some more work with my sliders, but instead, I'm going to go ahead to the local adjustment tools, very specifically the radio filter. And now when you open the radio filter, you get a whole new menu. And sometimes I'm on a laptop right now, you actually don't get the whole picture. Two things that I like to do before I start. Make sure that invert is checked. Invert means inside. And what I mean by inside is it's inside the circle that we're going to draw around our subject's face. The second thing I want is I don't want any sliders set before I start because that throws me off. Whatever I did last has no bearing on what I'm gonna do now. So I will double click the word effect before I start. And that's gonna zero out all of my sliders. And with that, I'm now ready to draw my first ellipse or my first circle. And I'm going to click and drag from the center of my subject up and out. And if you notice, I'm not trying to be accurate here. I'm going to move and rotate my ellipse just a little bit. And here is where I'm absolutely going to ask everyone, if you're following along, don't try to make this that big. And the reason for it is, if you notice, I'm hovering over the center pin. I have a feather going from 100% density or 100% transparency of the changes I'm going to make to zero at the edges. And that's what this red represents. And you can change that color by tapping shift and the letter O. And by tapping shift and the letter O, you can actually change the color of your mask. I'm going to change it to green. So I'm going to make a big loose radio over my subject's face. And all I want to do is adjust the tone of the face and the shadow detail. So I don't want to use my exposure slider. I actually want to work in my shadows slider. And you'll see by bringing my shadow slider up, I can really open up a tremendous amount of detail. Hmm. I'm going to back this off until I have the kind of tone that I would like to have here. And I'm just going to leave it here right around 40 to start with. And the eyes, 
are still a little on the dark side. I'm going to zoom to one to two here. So there's still a lot of shadow in the eyes. And so to add to an existing radio or any of the uh, other local adjustment tools, which would be the gradient, the radio, or the brush, I'm going to now choose new. And that's going to give me the opportunity, again, I've got my crosshair to make a new radio. I'm going to rotate it over the eye. And if I hover, you'll see I have my gradient uh, mask. And I'm going to open up the shadows here just a little more. And you'll see that I, let me just zero that out so you can see if I go to 100, that that is just a little bit of extra light in there. And if I don't get enough, because sometimes you use a lot of uh, shadow, a lot of percentage of shadow, I might go to the exposure slider and move it up a tenth. Now I'm going to do a right click. If you're on a PC, it would be a, uh, sorry, on a, be a control click on a PC, right click on a PC, a uh, control, control click on a Mac, and I'm going to duplicate this. And you'll notice, by the way, when I duplicated it, that I don't see two. Like in Photoshop, sometimes when you uh, control, sorry, when you command copy and paste, you'll see a slight offset. But these two are right on top of each other. And I'm going to move this over the other eye. And maybe I want to make that just a touch brighter. So it's all the same settings. And I've just moved this up to a point two. If I click done here, and go back to my full screen. So mm -hmm. here's my before and after. So I'm going to hit my backslash key. That's my before. And that's my after. I still would like some more tone in that background because I know there's some tone here. So I'm going to return to my radio filter. And if you'll notice, all my settings are now at zero and at invert because whatever you start with before you start doing your radials is what you're going to return to when you create a new one. But in this case, I'm going to select my master radial, the one that affects my subject's face. And I'm going to duplicate this. And I'm going to shift it off to the side. And you can see I have two pins here. That pin is my subject. This pin is my duplicate. And I'm going to uncheck the invert. Because I want to now double click the word effect and darken my background. So I can bring some tone into the rest of my picture. As you can see, I've got some more exposure here that I can work with. So I'm going to just tap hover over the exposure slider and tap my down arrow key to just bring a little bit more tone into my picture. Backslash to look at before and after. And like David, I want to throw this up on Instagram. I might make a square. And that would be my final image. There's my before and there's my after. And what's something about before and after is it doesn't show the before crop. It only shows the crop that you're currently using. So if that's Maybe working. It would be jarring if you were crop, zooming in and out from the crop. It would be hard to tell the develop settings. Uh, actually, that's true, yes. Sometimes I wish I could have that option to decide whether or not I want to show that before or after crop, but that's not available in Lightroom. So if that's working with a subject that's backlit and with a, uh, a face that's in shadow. So those are the basic steps for doing that. And from here, now I'm going to move to a landscape that I shot in Siena, Italy. And like with the first photo, I'm going to just go ahead and do an auto develop for this. And you'll notice that here auto actually works really, really well. This is the brilliance of Lightroom's auto. And this is the machine learning that uh, who knows how it works, but it does work. One click. And I know the first time I did this, I was just totally blown away by how that 
um, did such a great job. So in this case, now I'm going to use all three tools. And I'm thinking about now, I've already done my, my developing, and I can see that I'd like my sky to be a little bit warmer. And I'd like my foreground, which is in a lot of dark shadow, to have a little more detail. And the middle of the photo should have some more contrast or some punch. So that's uh, the basic things that I'm seeing here that I'd like to accomplish, along with maybe brightening up the fog. So when I go to any one of my three local adjustments, the gradient, the radial, or the adjustment brush, I'm always going to end up with the same menu that opens up down here. And by the way, that when that menu opens, it pushes the basic panel down. So the basic panel is not actually missing. It's just below the settings for these three filters. And with this now, you can see I've got a setting in here that I don't want. So I'm going to double click my word effect. And that's going to zero all my settings. And with the gradient, there is no invert. So there's no options here for invert. And I'm going to go ahead and click and drag a gradient down. And if I hold the shift key, it's going to snap that gradient into a perfect horizontal 45 degree angle or um, linear. So if you dragged it to the side, you would also see it lines up. So that's the shift key. And for me now to uh, get this to release in exactly the right way, I'm going to release my mouse click first and then my shift key. And I'd like my sky to be a little warmer in this shot. So I'm going to just take this temperature slider and move it over a little bit. You'll see I can make it really orange, but I just want it to be a little bit warmer. And I want a little more detail in the sky, and that's where I'm going to use clarity. You can see how I get a little bit more snap in the clouds in the sky. And at the same time, I'm going to use this gradient again and I'm going to do a gradient from the bottom of my picture. And I'm going to hold the shift key down. And I'm going to come up. And I'm going to double click the word effect here because I want to zero this out. And I want to open up just my shadows. So you can see how I can just open those shadows up a little bit. So I get a little bit more foreground detail. And if I want to get a little more, I grab the pin and bring it up. And again, hovering over the pin is going to show you your mask. It's just representative of the area of the picture that's going to be changed. If you don't see green, there will not be a change. Next, I want to get a little more detail in the middle of my image. I'd like these mountains to be a little more defined. So I'm going to take my radial filter now, make sure that it says invert. And here I'm going to click and drag across the middle of my photo, just like that. And if you notice, I'm going beyond the actual outside of my live area, my image area. And I'm just going to go to the clarity slider. And if you notice, when I drag the clarity slider up, I can get some more detail out of that. And I need to be careful that I don't affect the rest of my picture. So I'm going to keep this to a minimum of about 20 or so. Backslash key. We've come a long way already since we started working on this photo. And next step here is I want to get this fog to be a little bit brighter and a little bit more kind of um, luminescent the way that I remember it. And so I'm going to pick the adjustment brush. And you'll notice here that right now I've got a very small adjustment brush. So I'm going to go down here. I'm going to adjust the size. And you'll see, again, I'm not trying to be accurate here because it's not Photoshop. We're not actually making masks. And I also don't want auto mask. I'm going to turn off auto mask because I don't want it selecting a range of tone for me. That's how forgiving these tools are, okay? 
So I'm gonna make this just a little bit smaller. And I'm going to turn on show selected mask overlay so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm gonna just click and drag here, there, go into the front, go over here, that's it. Not accurate at all. This is a very, very, very um, forgiving process. And I'm just going to go to my highlight slider here. And I'm going to move my highlight slider over to brighten just that area of range of tone that the fog is in. So there's my brightening up of my fog. And that's the basic way to use the adjustment brush, not to try and be specific, just to be fair, you could have chosen the auto masking feature, but auto masking generally tends to pick a range of tones and the masking in general in Lightroom is not the kind of masking that you're used to using in Photoshop because Photoshop is a much more accurate masking program. So this would be it. And if I wanted to see before and after here, I might tap the Y key. Let me hide my side panels by tapping tab. And so that's where I started on the left and on the right is my before and after and the Y key will bring me back to my image area. By the way, if you tap the F key, you can go full screen. So you can really see the image. And F again will bring you back tab will return your side panels. And so that's the basics behind using the three adjustment tools for a landscape and the adjustments for doing a portrait. Awesome. That's great, DA. Thank you. Done. We don't have any um, open questions. So did you want to, uh, if anybody's got any questions, let us know. We've got a few minutes left. Do you want to try one more, DA? Or Travis, do you have a suggestion or an idea? No, I mean, those tools are so powerful and it shows how quickly you can do something and get yeah. that zest and punch in, in Lightroom and what makes it such a great and valuable tool. It's really great to yeah. see the before and after where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, if you want me to do another one, I've got one more or we can just uh, discuss a little bit uh, why about why what we've we been do doing. One more? You want me to do one more? Yeah. Well, I can do my scary guys. <laughs> I love it. Uh, those are those are the cops. I walked. My wife was totally panicked when I walked up to <laughs> these guys and said, "Can I take your picture?" And this guy clenched his fist. I mean, oh, this, this, he clenched his fist. He wanted to make sure I could see his muscles and his his six pack abs. He was like <laughs> totally scary. Anyway, and then this woman in the rearview mirror was uh, just. She was there. She was laughing. Yeah, I've got a question from yep. uh, Chin, who is on the uh, list. I thought maybe you can answer this while you're doing the demo. Sure. Chin's asking, how do you enable the color when masking? So as you lay down a mask, maybe you can go into a little bit of detail about yeah. changing the colors and turning the mask on and off and stuff like that. Yep, I can. Uh, so I'm going to just do a quick auto right there. And again, um, it kind of did what I wanted it to do, uh, my before and after here. And you can see my sky's pretty burned out, even from my uh, histogram here. So uh, for the sake of brevity and, and time, I'm going to go ahead and just open up some shadow detail and knock down some highlights. So I'm going to pick my radial filter, make sure all my settings are at zero, and my invert is checked. And I'm going to draw a radial over my guy okay. here. Nice and loose. I'm going to zoom in. Now, if I choose show selected mask overlay, right now I'm in green. If I hold down my shift key and tap the letter zero, uh, letter zero, the, uh, the, <laughs> the letter O. Welcome to Sesame Street. That will let that. me rotate through a series of, thank you, a letter, uh, a range of colors. So, there's no color in this preview. This is red. I'm, I'm just holding down the shift key and tapping the letter O. So that's red. I tap the letter O again, gives me green. I get white. That's another color and then no color. And that's how you get the colors 
for your mask. Because sometimes the red gets in the way of working, sometimes the green gets in the way of working. So I'm going to just uncheck my show selected mask overlay. Hovering over the pin will also do the same thing. So in this, this image, I'm going to just take down the tones on the left side of his face by taking my highlights down. And I'm going to open up the shadows on the other side of his face just a little bit. Really brings the details in his glasses. It's great. Right. Well, you know who's in his glasses? <laughs> I'm thinking you. <laughs> oh, wow. It's amazing. Me. Yeah, that's me. Okay. So, so I've done that for this one. Uh, this guy doesn't have a lot of uh, brightness on his face. So I'm just going to go ahead and zoom in. Click and drag up and out. You can always go down and over. And I'm going to just work on the shadows here, pop it up a little bit. You don't want to go really high because it's just not natural looking. But I call this a little bit of fill flash when you don't have a fill flash. Just a little bit here to get some more detail in his face. Click done. Go zoom out. Here's my before. And here's my after. Now maybe I want to make this a little bit darker. So again, I'm going to hover over the slider and I'm just going to tap my down arrow key to make the scene just a little bit darker. Oh. It's, it's always my, uh, my position in life that everywhere I go, the skies are uh, lacking in clouds. So, <laughs> uh, I never seem to get what I want. So yeah, so that's the, uh, another just quick once uh, once more over with the uh, radial filter using the uh, local adjustment tools. That's fantastic. Okay. I think we're close on time there, Travis. Yeah, I, we, that's pretty much the full hour. I want to obviously thank you guys so much. And uh, I'm sure we're going to do a, a, some series and more of these. And uh, if people have uh, interest in exactly what they kind of want to do, please reach out to these guys and they're going to have their links here. Um, and they're here to answer questions and, and answer your questions. And uh, they want to hear from you. And uh, we love having them on. And uh, we want to hear what you have to say in terms of what you want to program for the next uh, couple ones, because we'd love to continue this series. Yeah, if you have any Great. questions about <clears throat> how this works, uh, sh uh, feel free to reach out. But also uh, let Travis know if you'd like to see uh, very specific tools or features in Lightroom demonstrated, and we'll put something together. Yeah, and it's just so incredible how powerful it is because, you know, uh, I actually teach uh, some uh, Adobe tutorials and create tutorials for Adobe on these. And you, with the radical filter, you can do luminosity masks and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, the, the power of it is just outstanding. Standing. It's just it's yeah. a powerful tool. And you Travis, showed how quickly you could take how quickly you could take a photo like that and just from the you know that base setting from hitting the auto and then tweaking it in how quickly you can make a photo come alive. Travis, this uh did we were recording this, yeah? I did. I did record this so right. we can put it back up so everyone here can actually go back and, and uh, review and get the tips so they don't have to take. Where can we time. find it? <laughs> uh, we're going to put it up on the APA uh, uh, photo uh, on our YouTube. Um, so uh, okay, I, great. Will, I will uh, put a link in and uh, uh, or just will put a link in here quickly and uh, to our APA. Actually, I can probably put it in right now. Um, great. And where can we, people find you exactly again? At lightroomguy.com. Lightroom I put in a, a link, uh, but it didn't actually highlight the URL because I didn't put HTTP in there. So let me put that in again. So on our website, we've got all of our services that we um, offer uh, on a commercial basis. Um, if you are an APA member, you get uh, a discount. To um, we're part of the member services. Absolutely. Um, and folks, you know, we're, we're, Typically what we do is uh, we, we do like a half hour strategy call with people if they're looking to work with us so they can answer a few questions about how we work and what we offer and, and what their needs are. But yeah, we're, we're always happy to uh, uh, talk to folks and, and help them you through. Are, you really kind of break it down from, you know, whether it's people's needs on computers or storage or, you know, pretty much advice on anything computer related, software related, all this kind of stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Again, we're photography and hardware and software relate. So yeah, we've, helped people spec out their machines. I had a guy once, he bought a brand new iMac Pro, uh, you know, like, I don't know how many cores in it. And I was like, well, you know, you can't actually use that for Lightroom because it's 
you're not going to, you just wasted a bunch of money. And so like, you know, we can spec people, things out for people and uh, idea. What else? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we set up raids, uh, network yeah. attached storage, NAS, uh, we spec out hard drives. Uh, we also take care of troubleshooting on Macs. We're more Mac centric than PC centric, but uh, we can uh, kind of uh, make our way through a PC as well. And, and then we work, we work remotely, so we use remote software. I think DA prefers okay. Join Me. I prefer uh, yeah. TeamViewer. Um, and we, we work with people all over the world. Uh, DA's work with people in Greece, in, in the Gulf states. I've got a client in India, uh, everywhere. And so we, um, uh, we can support people. I mean, we kind of have to this way anyway. Yeah. But I mean, without actually physically plugging something in, we can do everything that we need to do with somebody over a re remote connection or the yeah. telephone so and when we can't uh frequently clients will send us their hard drives yes. we are yeah i mean we're pretty well versed like i said in max and getting libraries organized we're just probably probably the best around so <laughs> don't be modest <laughs> yay <laughs> you guys know your stuff so, there's no doubt about that you guys know your stuff well you know when you've done a few hundred of these you kind of get a get the hang of it so yep. yeah you guys, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, thanks everybody for showing up. We appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. Yeah. Hope everyone's well. We'll get this up on YouTube and uh, please let us know uh, what you like and what you want for next uh, stuff. Thanks. Great. Be safe, everybody. Thank you, Travis. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Take, take care, care, guys. Bye bye.